And here we go. Hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, today's webinar presented by Camo Plan, uh, Real Estate Investing Simplified, How to Make Passive Income in a Real Estate Investment Fund, featuring Dave Van Horn. Uh, real quick, before we get started, I just need to give a quick disclosure. Uh, the views expressed by speakers at the Camo Plan webinars are those of the speakers only and may not reflect those of Camo, its members, or employees. Camo does not guarantee the accuracy of information provided by the speakers or attendees. Professional advisors should be consulted before implementing any options presented. CAMA absolutely does not endorse or recommend any individual or organization, including the speakers. CAMA, its members, and employees do not accept liability for losses and or damages arising from errors or omissions within, reliance upon, or any use of the information provided by the speakers. Individuals are strongly encouraged by CAMA to conduct their own due diligence before making any investment choices. CAMA does not act as nor offer the services of an investment advisor, CPA, realtor, or attorney. If tax, legal, accounting, investment, or other similar expert assistance is required, the services of a competent professional should be sought. Typically, Will, our client executive, is here, uh, but he is out sick today, so I am Michael Duncan. I'm here. Um, but there is Will's contact information. If you have any interest in getting to know more about what we do here at CAMA Plan, please feel free to shoot him an email, give him a call. Uh, but at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dave Van Horn, our speaker today. And please know that there is a chat and a Q&A. Uh, we will open for questions at the end. But if you have some during the webinar, please feel free to uh, send them in. So, Dave, I am now handing it over to you. I appreciate that, Michael. Um, and ditto on the uh, disclaimers. <laughs> I'm not an investment advisor either. I just want to make, just let me know that you can see my screen and hopefully I, you see, it. I can hopefully see, you it, see yep. the right thing, right? Yep, you're good. So it's uh, obviously um, uh, Dave Van Horn, like you said, and uh, I'm not an investment advisor either. I'm not an accountant. I'm not an attorney um, or any of those things. <laughs> um, but I'm here today to just talk about real estate investing simplified. And we're going to touch on some of what that means uh, today. So usually, uh, before I get started, I like to tell a quick story about opportunity. Um, you see, when I was eight years old, my dad had left my mom with six kids. And at the time, you know, it was somewhat traumatic. And, um, you know, I, uh, you know, when a lot of my friends were home in bed asleep early, you know, early in the morning, I was up uh, delivering the Philadelphia Inquirer and uh, had a job from the fourth grade on and uh, hustled. And I didn't mind because I was making some money for books and clothes and things like that and helped my mom out. And uh, a couple of years later, my mom came to me in the eighth grade with a unique opportunity. And that opportunity was to take an entrance exam to uh, a college prep school which was out of state. And for me, it was a big change in my world, right? It was a, it was a, a, a unique opportunity. So my mom kind of tricked me and she said, you know, at first I was objecting, you know, I was saying, oh, we can't afford it. I can't go there. I want to be with my friends, that kind of thing. And she kind of conned me and said, don't worry, you won't get in. And then I uh, obviously kind of know where this is going. I went and took the exam. And next thing you know, um, it kind of catapulted me into a different world of different people and um, a different network, different relationships, that kind of thing. And um, and then later on, you know, I went to college. I was one of the only uh, siblings that went to college and completed and things like that. Um, and then obviously today, um, you know, I'm an executive chairman at, at PPR. But um, just that one opportunity uh, dramatically changed things. And I think everyone has these opportunities. I know you've probably seen, you know, Joel Steen on TV where he's, uh, are you ready to receive it today? Um, and that's kind of the way I feel about opportunities. They come, you know, they cross our path, but are we ready to receive those opportunities? And there were several times through my life that those opportunities came up. You know, one was, you know, I was a contractor after I got out of college and then I became a realtor. Then I became an investor. You know, I had the opportunity to get into the note business. Um, and, we, you know, we're going to talk about some of that. And then later on, became CEO. And, um, and, and today, what today's conversation is, is more about how you can go from being an active investor to a passive investor. And I've kind of done that in a couple of areas of my life. Um, so I've 
going from being an active CEO to being executive chairman now, uh, which is uh, not as active a role as I've gotten older. Uh, and then the same way in my investing, how I've gone from being a very active investor who was always in accumulation mode to being in, in more of a passive function. So I'm going to touch on some of that. And then some of the normal uh, things, you know, I am married and have two grown sons and four grandkids and all that good stuff. And I, I am from the Philadelphia area and have a lot of hobbies that other people have as well, right? So nothing out of the ordinary <laughs> there. So uh, some of the things today, um, we're going to touch on how to make passive income in a real estate investment fund. And like I said, we're going to talk about how I transitioned from active to passive, uh, what a diversified balanced private equity real estate fund actually is, uh, what PPR, my PPR capital management, my firm invests in today, uh, some of the advantages of passive real estate fund investing, and, um, and then ways to get started. So um, hopefully we don't go too long. I know it's lunchtime right now. So, so one of the things I always like to say is that we're all in the note business. And so what do I mean by that? A note is just a promise to pay, right? Like a promissory note. But I believe that the note business is happening all around us, right? There's student loan debt, medical debt, auto debt, uh, what we invest in is typically mortgage debt, which is a note and a mortgage. So it's a note that has collateral. Uh, there's also credit card debt. And, you know, in the, in the United States in particular, there's all kinds of debt, trillions and trillions of dollars of debt. And one of the things I like to point out to people is that a lot of us aren't really participating in it, right? It's just like happening all around us. But even for those of you attending today, if you were in the room that you're in and you looked around, just about everything you can see has been financed on some level, whether it's the building, the furniture, the, your clothing, everything has been you know, business loans or whatever type of loans. Uh, there's been all kinds of uh, financing going on around just about everything in the world, even land, right? So, so I like to say we're all in the note business. Now, how active a participant you are is a different story. Um, but it's just, uh, I think what uh, attracted me first about the note business uh, when I personally started was we found a way where we could buy notes at a discount with a high yield with collateral. So that was very appealing to us in the beginning. So most of my life, I was always this active investor. I was always a hands-on guy. Um, and I was always in accumulation mode, just constantly accumulate more assets, accumulate more assets, you know, buy more real estate, do all these, buy, have more notes, buy more notes, have more investments. And I was always in this accumulation mode. Um, but one of the things I was telling my actually 17 year old grandson recently is that there's one goal in life, and that's to get as much passive income as fast as possible and to have as much tax advantage as you can. And here we are on a camera call, um, which if you think about it, if you can have money that's tax deferred or uh, tax free, uh, that's the that's the best kind of money, right? <laughs> so, um, so here's a picture of when I was an active investor. And I know you may be chuckling and going, this is a very nice backyard of a property. This is actually one of my old properties after a clean out of the tenant moving out, all the stuff being in the backyard. And to give you a color, um, you know, I started out in real estate. Like I said, I was a realtor for over 35 years. I was a contractor. I started accumulating properties. And uh, yeah, outside Philadelphia, I had gotten up to 40 places at one point, right? Which is pretty significant. Um, and then I was also a property manager at a Remax. So I managed units for other real estate investors. And what I quickly found was, um, you know, I was always dealing with landlord tenant issues. I was always going to court. I was in court weekly. Um, so, so I don't know if anybody on this call is going to court weekly. You could relate to what my activities were. Um, and I was also doing a lot of inspections, right? So it was very active business. And then even years later, I had a property management firm for 20 uh, plus years. I was actually a real estate investor since 1989. 1989 was my first property. So long time, 30 something years. Um, and I still am today, but in a different way. And I'm going to talk about some of that. But um, so I was a very active guy. And even with a property management firm, they were never calling me to wish me a happy birthday or anything. It was always something 
uh, more traumatic or cost me money or, or that kind of thing. So there's a big difference between being uh, active in real estate and passive in real estate. And I know the IRS likes to say that oh, real estate investing is passive, but is it really? Um, and and the, you, you probably already know that answer. It's not, right? So when you're standing in line at Home Depot to get supplies for your rental property, uh, that's not really passive in my mind. So, um, but one of the things I, when I'm working with, uh, you know, different investors, a lot of times that's one of my first questions is, you know, what kind of investor are you? Um, you know, what kind of time do you have? What kind of experience do you have? What, what's your, uh, you know, how much available uh, energy can you put into this? How much capital do you have? So that kind of dictates uh, some of the things you could do as a real estate investor. Personally, today, I am more of a K-1 investor. And you may be thinking, you know, why, right? I, I, I guess it was about a year and a half, two years ago that I sold off my last 14 properties. Um, and believe it or not, I did a lot of that for my wife and my family. So as I've gotten older, I was like, you know, it was less about all the money and all the cash flow and all the write-offs and things. And I found other ways to do that through, you know, uh, K-1 type investing in various syndications or in various uh, real estate funds or no funds, uh, funds like PVR, for example, um, those types of activities. Uh, but it was more about, um, you know, a capital ga gains play. Uh, there's other ways to get tax advantages and depreciation without having to actively own so there's cases where I'm a limited partner, I'm a general partner, uh, sometimes um, a balance sheet signer in some activities. So I do a variety of things today, but it is all passive at this point. It's strictly K-1s uh, other than you know shares I own in my company or something. Um, so now my, uh, my activities are more around finding best-in-class operators, strict underwriting, strict vetting, uh, oversight, and then diversification. Uh, to compensate for that. Now, you might say, well, when you're, you're not as active and hands-on, you don't have as much control. There is some truth to that, but I found a happy medium to make that work. Um, and then it actually, I think it benefits my wife uh, and my, uh, my heirs much better uh, than it did in the past because my, you know, my wife wasn't super uh, financially astute. Uh, she wasn't necessarily uh, wanted to manage a bunch of properties, that kind of thing. She didn't like to have to make bunch of decisions and have all this responsibility, those types of things. So there's there's some merit in the fact. Uh, and then the other piece is as you get older, and a lot of people don't talk about that. They just go, oh, I'm going to accumulate a bunch of properties. I'm going to do that forever. Um, that sounds great. So you're 91, like my mom, uh, my mom owned a, a bunch of properties too. And uh, trust me, it doesn't very work the same when you're 91 <laughs> as it does when you're 41. So it's, a, it's just a different thing, um, just from the responsibility and, and that type of thing. And it does take, one of the things I noticed when I did it about a year and a half, two years ago, was a lot of the responsibility that was in my brain went away. And it's actually refreshing, as, is the only thing I can describe it as. You know, I just don't have a lot of stuff to worry about. Like, I don't have to worry about storms and hurricanes and floods and earthquakes and this and that, and trees falling and that, you know. Just don't have any of that, you know. Uh, I don't have anybody calling me. I don't have a property manager calling me. Um, yet I own a lot of real estate all over the country uh, without that. Um, so the other thing is leverage. I did want to touch on this because you know I've had some uh, high-level coaching over the years, and one of my best coaches used to ask me this question uh, periodically, and he would say, "Dave." What is the one thing that you can leverage in the next six to 12 months that will catapult you in your business or personal life? And it could be in your investing as well, right? What's that one thing that you can leverage? So there were many things over the years that uh, I was able to leverage. Um, you know, in the beginning, uh, I didn't have much capital. I was a contractor. I was handy. I was a realtor. I had the MLS, but I didn't have capital. And initially, I started using credit cards uh, to help me invest in properties. And then later on, use private money and hard money and those types of things. And then institutional bank money as well. So leverage was very critical to me expanding my portfolio and to growing my investments. Um, and then I built up a lot of equity in my properties. And then I became a lender. I was a hard money lender for a while. So I lent money out. 
But there's various things we can leverage. And I know even at PPR, we leverage JV partners, we leverage consultants, we leverage technology, we leverage capital, obviously, because we uh, PPR raises quite a bit of capital. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can leverage. And I just want to point that out, that the way that we utilize leverage could change the way that you invest, that you could be more efficient. So hopefully some of that uh, makes sense. I know personally, um, for me, uh, even in our company, you know, I mentioned how I went to a K-1 world and, you know, invest in syndications and various funds and sold off the properties and things. But even on the corporate side, uh, we kind of went um, from being an asset management company strictly, um, you know, act actively managing a lot of notes to being more passive and actually bringing a best in class asset management firm to manage the bulk of our portfolio today. So what we were able to do was focus more on our unique ability. And that's something I've been able to do personally as well. Um, and, you know, by doing that, it's like, what do I know best? Um, I know from a personal point of view, my passive investing strategy is quite simple. It's really short-term, mid-term, long-term, tax advantage, non-tax advantage. And I like to invest in things that I know about, uh, which tend to be lending related, real estate related, uh, things that, that I've had a license in before. You know, I've had a real estate license, insurance license, you know, I'd owned a title company, those types of, that background has helped me in, in my investing. So what is some of the PPR story? Um, today, we're located just outside Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in uh, Berwyn. And uh, we were founded in 2007. We have 32 employees. Um, and pretty much the way we got started, uh, to be quite honest, was a little bit by accident. Uh, we started out as investors. Uh, we only, Me and my partners only had a couple of loans. Um, and um, we tested the model. It worked out. We used some of our own capital in the beginning. and made sure things worked. And then, uh, and then we went out to friends and family at first and raised a little bit of money. And then, and then as it continued to progress, we went out and raised more and more capital. And then one thing led to another and the business uh, kind of took off from there. But um, we went from being, the, the irony is I went from being an investor to being a very active you know, CEO for about the last 15 and a half years up until recently. Uh, when I did uh, hire a gentleman named Steve Meyer uh, as our new CEO. So even on a personal level, I've gone into a more passive mode as I've gotten older, mainly through succession planning, you know, being proactive. Um, you know, we went and uh, actually I hired a coach to uh, assist in some of the succession planning. Uh, you know, we have several C-level members that are in their 60s. You know, it was it was prudent as this fund fast approaching a billion dollars under management that you start to be proactive in your succession planning. And also it enabled to free me up to work in my unique ability. And I believe Steve's going to help us to probably 10x this business from here, uh, which is kind of exciting, right? So we're definitely transforming PPR capital management as well. And if you notice, we had a name change. We used to be PPR uh, note company, and today we're PPR capital management. So, you know, some people say, well, what exactly do you do? <laughs> well, we raise capital, uh, we source opportunities, we evaluate them. Uh, once we acquire them, we manage them. And obviously we make money either in cash flow uh, from various verticals or from the sale of properties as well. And then we distribute those returns back to the investors and turn around and do that all over again. And it's just, uh, this is a snapshot of uh, our flywheel, I would say. Um, and it gives you uh, an idea of how we just keep turning this thing and the faster that we can do that, the, the better, obviously. Now, here's a little bit of our current numbers. Um, this was as of last quarter. Uh, we were at $281 million in equity under management at $635 million of AUM. Um, we have three different verticals. Uh, we have the NPL business, which is non-performing loans. Uh, we have some commercial loans. And then we have some commercial real estate. And I can uh, probably show the breakdown of what that looks like here. So we're about still about 75% in the MPL, RPL, REO world. So what does MPL stand for? Non-performing loan, which is really a non-performing mortgage. RPL is a re-performing loan or mortgage. 
and then REO is real estate owned, that means that's a piece of property that was taken back through foreclosure. So it's really a bank owned property. And all the loans we buy are bank originated. They're all throughout the United States. They're pretty well diversified. Um, and we still, that's still the bulk of the business that we do with our, our JV partners uh, who are our, our asset managers. And then about five to 6% of our portfolio is in commercial loans. They, they are also one to four family residential for the most part. We do occasionally do some uh, commercial loans in the one to 10 million range that are, you know, construction loans or bridge loans. We don't do too much of that in the current environment, We're mostly um, hard money loans. We call them short-term business loans, um, but they are hard money loans tied to a piece of uh, real estate. Uh, we own 20% of the company that we are a facility for. We give them the capital to lend out uh, and they originate hard money loans in 45 states. And PPR has first right of refusal to buy those loans. And you may be thinking, well, why do you do that? Um, and we do that to regulate capital. And it's one of the ways that we're able to pay investors. When we raise capital, we can park money in hard money loans until we're ready to purchase a pool of, um, of mortgages or ready to purchase a piece of commercial real estate. So it's just a way for us to pay our investors while we're waiting to make uh, you know, an investment or a purchase. And then we do a portion of multifamily. It's always sitting in the 15 to 20% range of the portfolio. Uh, today, we're just under 1,000 units. Um, these uh, two verticals were just started, I'd say about two years ago, uh, we started to expand uh, what PPR invested in. Um, and it's it, for a combination of reasons. Some were tax reasons, some were to diversify our portfolio, and some was to stabilize the portfolio more. Um, but it gives us more options in various market conditions to invest in. So as far as diversification, uh, you can see here, this is just a snapshot in a particular quarter of the top 10 states. Uh, they tend to be, you know, California, Florida, Texas, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, that kind of thing. Um, and it's the same way with our investors as well. Our investors tend to be, it's where the population is. And that's that's where the loans are as well, right? So um, a lot of the loans that we have are spread out through the country. Um, and that's, you know, it's good for investors if you think about it. Uh, it would be very difficult for an individual mortgage investor to diversify to this extent, right? It takes quite a bit of capital. Um, you know, a lot of times people uh, ask me that. They'll say, what is the biggest risk in the note mortgage business? And a lot of times I'll say it's you because it's the amount of capital you have deployed into the marketplace. Uh, obviously, you know, you'll see banks like Bank of America, Wells Fargo, you know, they would ha rather have, you know, 30 million mortgages than 30 million properties, right? It's more scalable, that kind of thing. And they can be well diversified across a, a large geography. So what are some of the advantages of this passive fund investing? Well, I mean, it truly is passive, right? It's real mailbox money. We're also shorter term than some real estate investments, for example. Um, so a lot of your syndications could be three to five years. And going forward, they may be longer. They may be five to seven years, maybe even to 10 years. Uh, you see that with like opportunity zones, for example. So, uh, you know, real estate's really not liquid. But in the note and mortgage business, it is very liquid. So we... We have uh, like lines of credit. We can put loans on the lines of credit and recapitalize. We we also do securitizations. We can put loans inside of securitization to recapitalize. We have a trade desk in New York. We can sell loans through the trade desk. So we're much more liquid than a typical uh, you know REIT or real estate fund would be. They don't necessarily have the type of liquidity that we have. And then we do get cash flow from a variety of sources. There's probably a good half a dozen or so ways that we generate cash flows, uh, as well as liquidating assets where um, that's more of a capital gain type activity. But there, um, but we do have a lot of liquidity. Uh, we can uh, raise capital very quickly. We can uh, put uh, various assets on lines of credit and recapitalize. So it's uh, shorter term, more liquid. Um, you also have limited liability when you invest in a note and mortgage fund. There's privacy, anonymity. You're really limited to um, your investment that is at risk. And you may go, well, big deal. What's so great about that? 
Well, if you bought a note and mortgage and you did something that violated a regulatory thing, for example, say you um, you know violated fair debt collection uh, laws or something, you could theoretically be sued for more than your investment. You could you could be sued for hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you might have only paid you know fifty thousand dollars for your loan, right? So there's a lot more liability there. Um, and there is in, in hard real estate too, there's probably more liability in there than there is in investing in say a syndication or a fund, right? So your, your liability is limited, you have privacy. And like I said, you're definitely diversified. You're, it's also more scalable, uh, definitely more passive. You get the advantage of professional management and experience, things like that. Um, you also have this pooled buying power that you really don't have as an individual investor so a lot of times you can get better sourcing, better resources, um, just like PPR, right? We have a trade desk, right? The average investor does not have access to a trade desk, right? They, they just don't have that, right? So, um, and that's a lot of that's coming from scale. So it's, it's very valuable that you're able to do uh, some of these things. So um, there's definitely a lot of advantages to being in a passive fund. I, I think there's a place for pretty much everyone's portfolio to be in, especially if you want some alternative investments and you want to be in something that's, you know, well diversified, um, falls in that time frame of our funds are typically one to three year. So if you're looking for an investment vehicle like that, that's well diversified, that's real estate backed, uh, there's probably some merit to, um, you know, people having a portion of their portfolio with us, that type of thing, or our this type of fund. So some of our current offerings right now, uh, we actually have two different funds and I'll explain why. One is uh, the Reliant Income Fund um, and then one is the uh, Freedom Fund. And the, the Freedom Fund is, uh, it's a sidecar fund. It's like, uh, it's running in conjunction with the other fund offering. And what it is, is it's structured differently to avoid UBIT, which is probably extremely valuable to somebody coming from a qualified plan or from a self-directed IRA account, for example. So UVIC can be a pretty expensive tax that could be incurred even in a qualified plan. And it's usually because the investment vehicle is using leverage or something like that. It's a true business that you're investing in. You could experience uh, UVIC and um, by being in the PPR Freedom Fund, you're avoiding UVIC and it's done through structure. It's more of a debt structure that doesn't use any leverage and that's why it's able to do that. But as far as the Reliant Income Fund, um, it has two main options. One is 10% for one year, and it has a 12% option for three years. Um, both funds allow you to compound as well. You can, you have a choice. You can receive payments ACH monthly. Some people like that. They like the cash flow. You know, maybe you're in retirement. You, you like to have that monthly cash flow come in like clockwork. Uh, we're in our 16th year. We have a pretty long track record of doing that. Um, and then the other one is the compounding option. So for example, if someone were to compound in the 12% fund, um, it actually shakes out to be about 14.47 is your return if you compound your returns inside that fund for the three-year term. Um, it is a $50,000 investment minimum in both funds. Um, and you know, the compounding option is a pretty good option. If you, th if you think about this, compared to owning hard real estate, for example, is a good analysis, right? Remember I said I used to own a lot of property and I owned every level of property, low income to higher income areas to you know every type of property you can imagine. And the one thing I noticed is if I was making a 30% return on principal interest taxes insurance, and I'm not even factoring in CapEx or repairs or anything or management, um, well, then I was, uh, you know, sometimes I'd be in a questionable area at that point. So most nicer properties are below that. Um, like there only be a 20 IRR or 15 IRR, but then you factoring, factor in management and maintenance, even if you're doing it yourself. Property management is usually eight, eight to 10 percent range. If you're in vacation areas, it's dramatically higher. It's Airbnb, it's dramatically higher. Um, unless you have a lot of units, you might get it down a little bit. But you know you got to factor in at least eight percent usually for property management, even if you're paying yourself that. Um, and then also if you get a move out, one move out could wipe out. I've seen it three years of cash flow before. Um, you know, so 
when you compare that to doing something passive that's doing 14.47, say in the Freedom Fund with no UBIT, um, that's probably equivalent to making something in the higher teens uh, for most people. That's a pretty good return uh, with pure mailbox money and uh, no activity to do. And I think one of the reasons people like this type of vehicle in a qualified plan or in a, uh, you know, a company like Kama Plan self-directed is because there's not a lot of activity during that three-year period, right? There's no check writing really or or a, a lot of activity in and out of the account. So fees are pretty much at a minimum in this type of investment vehicle. So there's there's definitely some advantages that I enjoy and some of the other investors enjoy. Uh, you know, I have family and friends that invest in, in this vehicle as well, right? So it is only open to accredited investors, high net worth, um, typically over 200,000 in income or a million dollars in net assets. As of this webinar, it uh, could potentially change, you never know. So, so probably the easiest way for folks to learn more or to get started uh, can easily go to PPR Capital Management, MGMT though, that's how it's spelled on the URL, pprcapitalmgmt.com forward slash invest or forward slash schedule. If you want to talk to one of our investor relations uh, representatives uh, to learn more. Uh, some people like to go to you know website and just get started. Some people uh, want to discuss some things or answer some questions. And uh, I'm more than happy to do some of that now. Um, Michael, I don't know if you're still on. and uh, Maybe we could open it up to a few questions. You might have some in the chat. I don't know. Yes, actually, I am still here. And uh, we do cool. have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, real quick, uh, one that I'm hoping is a simpler one. Is this a K-1 situation or 1099? It is a K-1. Um, so anyone investing in PPR, usually it's uh, like an ordinary income. Uh, it is possible to have some interest income in a, in a fund. Um, but most of the time, it's ordinary income and it's a K-1. There we go. Hopefully that answered your question, Bob. Uh, and then we have another one. Uh, can I use my SEP through an SDIRA to invest in this? Yes. Yeah. Any, that some qualified, any qualified plan. I mean, we, you know, we get uh, HSAs, we get um, Coverdales, you know, college funds, you name it. Um, 401k, every type. Um we actually have uh, some of members of our team are well versed in working with that and the paperwork and assisting uh, folks with that. Um, a good percentage of the capital raised through PPR is uh, is from qualified plans for sure. And we've got another one. Uh, how quickly will the money be deployed? Well, you know that's an interesting question because we're quicker than most. It's always less than twenty one days, so it's twenty one days or less. Um, most of the time it's in the week range. Um, and the reason being is because we do invest in those short-term uh, business loans. And that's something that PPR is, is somewhat unique because I've been investing, I'm personally investing a lot of different things. Um, and I've had some investments where I'm waiting. It's, it's not unheard of to wait 60 days. I have some investments. I waited six months before it actually started. So I understand that question because, you know, it's dormant money. You're not making a return on that. Uh, that's something that's pretty much, you know, it's a different thing with PPR, um, especially. And when the terms are up, you know, people have a choice of getting a return of capital. Some people will roll into a current fund offering. And in a lot of cases, they never miss, you know, a payment or a return uh, while they're doing that. And, you know, there's something to be said for this downtime, uh, you know, one, another uh, comparison sometime is investing in, say, hard money deals um, where you have to go find the hard money deal. And then the hard money deal, you know, the average hard money deal will last eight to nine months. Even if it's a one year contract, they usually last on average about eight, nine months. Well, then I got to go find another deal and another deal. So sometimes even though it's a higher rate on a one off hard money deal, it's hard to keep that money deployed all the time because I, I do hard money lending myself. Right. So I've done that for years and. But the one thing about a fund like this that makes it easier as I, as I get older and lazier <laughs> is I don't have to keep doing that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, sometimes the fund might be a little bit less than hard money. Um, but then again, it's fully deployed all 12 months, right? It's not, I don't get the money back. I have to go find another deal, do new paperwork. Uh, there's something to be said for that. Um, 
you know, I know I, one time I was sitting around a pool with my cousin and we do a lot of activity, a lot of real estate activity, a lot of lending. And he's like, you know, I hope our heirs appreciate all the work we're doing in our qualified plans because it, it can be cumbersome with all the paperwork sometimes, right? So that is an advantage to this type of investing. Once you're in a fund, you can kind of, I don't say set it and forget it, but it is pretty much like that. Uh, it's very low activity and your money's deployed literally most of the time. You know, you don't have this issue, but it's a great question. No, it was a good question. And uh, we've got someone asking if you could repeat the difference between the income fund versus the freedom fund. Yes. Well, they both have the same uh, terms, rates, and they both invest in the same investment vehicles, right? So they both have the same percentage of fund investment. Really what the difference is with the freedom fund, it's more of a, a structural thing uh, to avoid UBIT. So it, it's really a, a debt fund that lends to the Reliant Income Fund and they invest in the same products. They just don't encounter UBIT because they don't use any leverage. Reliant Income Fund does use leverage. So when we raise private equity from folks like that could be on this call, for example, we marry that with some institutional capital and then we go out and purchase uh, like non-performing loans, for example. And usually the way that'll work is we're going out making multiple purchases over about a 15 to 18 month period. And then we'll typically securitize and then we'll wind down that portfolio, which takes about 33 to 36 months in total. And then we go and do that again and we go do that again. But uh, so it's kind of like a dollar cost averaging of getting to a critical mass of mortgages in a portfolio to be able to securitize. And securitize is just a fancy word for refinancing a pool of mortgages to a fixed rate, better terms. And then we uh, work through the remaining assets, wind that down, and then sell off the tail of that uh, pool of loans. So there's, um, so I forget what the question was. <laughs> it was something uh, about- Repeating the, the difference between the income fund versus the freedom fund. Right. And, and so, uh, you know, the Reliant Income Fund is, a, uh, you know, an active fund that's utilizing leverage. That's really what it is to go accumulate. And to securitize, we need a critical mass of two to 300 million in assets to give you color. Um, so we're typically buy, 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 you know, we're in a heavy buying mode for 15, 18 months, uh, to get up to a critical mass to securitize. Uh, and then we go and repeat that process and, and then do it again. So that is 75% of our business. That's our, that, that's the core business. And that's where a lot of the UBIT could come from. And even on the commercial uh, note side, that five to 6% of our portfolio that we use to regulate capital. Uh, there is times where we're using leverage there, uh, where we put those loans on a line of credit, that kind of thing. So anytime a fund is utilizing leverage to make any kind of revenue, you could experience some form of UBIT that could be passed through to uh, the investors. And it could be significant. Um, the highest tax for UBIT, I believe, is as high as 37%, right? I believe it's the top rate. So I'm not an accountant. I'm sure you can check with one. But if you're investing in a qualified plan, you will absolutely want to avoid UBIT. I know I do that myself. If, if there's uh, UBIT involved, I usually avoid it uh, I, or I'll use regular money for that investment. We really didn't talk about that. Um, that is something when I was mentioning my strategy, I do align my investments with the type of money I have or the, where my money's coming from, for example. Like I would never borrow short-term money and put it in a long-term investment, which sounds probably obvious. Uh, <laughs> but I also put, uh, uh, what do you, what would you say? I'll put my qualified money into a lot of things that don't have tax advantages sometimes. And then I'll put my earned income into things that have tax breaks, like depreciation and things like that to offset some of my earned income. So that's just my strategy. I'm not saying I'm right or the only way to do it, but that be thinking about, you know, where does my money come from? How is it treated tax-wise? And then what am I investing in to try to maximize some of that? So um, yes, you definitely, uh, if you can avoid UBIT, it's probably recommended. And real quick, uh, I'm just going to jump ahead uh, for one second. Uh, someone asked that you could please define UBIT, just like a quick, easy definition. Unearned business income tax um, is what it stands for. It's really that you're making, it's really tax on money you're making because your qualified plans investing in a business so that you're making, and it, it's similar to this too. Um, if you bought a piece of, say you bought a rental property in your uh, IRA account, for example, and I were to use a non-recourse loan to do that, 
I could experience UBIT on the loan portion of that investment. So say I put up, I'll make simple numbers, $25,000 of IRA money with, or no, it's probably, the non-recourse loan is probably what, 60 LTV. It's, it's, a, it's a safer type of loan because it's non-recourse. So let's say I put up $40,000 and the loan is $60,000 and it's a non-recourse loan and I buy the property in my IRA. Um, and then I sell the $100,000 property, you know, I don't know, five years later for $150,000. Well, that gain, a big, that uh, same percentage of that gain would, could experience UBIT for the part that was utilizing leverage. Well, it's similar in our world. If our business is using leverage to generate returns, uh, you could, that, that UBIT could be passed through to investors uh, on their K-1s. But by us having uh, a freedom fund that's structured differently, uh, that doesn't use leverage, do you, you avoid the UBIT. So hopefully that makes sense. No, it made sense to me. And if it made sense to me, it probably made sense to everyone. Um, but uh, we have another question. Uh, any non-accredited investor options or sophisticated investor options? You know, that's a good question. Years ago, we did used to, you know, we used to sell notes and uh, we used to have warranties and we used to back our notes and um, you could sell a note to anyone. You don't, you didn't have to be accredited to purchase a note. Today, we don't because of our size and that we have a trade desk and um, we kind of outgrew that, but there are still um, places to do that for the unaccredited because I have relatives and family and friends that are unaccredited that look for this type of vehicle. And there are some funds that have a Reg A option. PBR currently doesn't, uh, but there are some funds out there that have a, a Reg A option allows for unaccredited. Sometimes the minimum investment's much lower. It could be $100 or $1,000, even that low, uh, to invest in some form of notes. Uh, but there are different companies that do that. Some are hard money companies. Some are uh, different types of note a note funds that allow for unaccredited. Currently, we don't. We have looked at that. It's uh, it's a big endeavor because of the complexity and the expense. Um, but we also are looking at at some point, maybe in the future, where we have direct investment too for our investors. So today we don't. We're just open to the accredited, uh, unfortunately. But there is there are ways to invest in the note space uh, for the unaccredited. It's just through other, you know, other companies uh, that have that available. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, another question, uh, how has interest rates, how have interest rates affected your investments? <laughs> well, everything costs more. Right? So, no, um, you know, it's funny. Um, it, it's changed some of our strategies. Like one of the things we do have a full-time uh, CIO who is an economist, market watch forecaster. So we get economic uh, updates regularly. We have an investment thesis for the year and for the quarter. Uh, we also have an investment committee. So it's not a case where uh, Dave Van Horn raises money and can go buy whatever I want or anything. Uh, but a lot of the strategies have shifted in the current environment from what it was, say, a year ago or, or two years ago. Uh, when we were in this up real estate market, rates were still very low. Uh, really, it, it dramatically impacts the cost of capital. Uh, but for us, it also brings in a lot of opportunities for us because we have a lot of private equity and, you know, you're going to see a lot of fallout, not a lot, but you're going to see some fallout, especially on the commercial real estate side with multifamily, office space, things like that, uh, some retail. Um, you know, there's already predictions on mall space, for example, there's what, 750 malls in the U.S. and they're expecting it to drop to 150 so um, you're going to see some disruption in office space and things like that, where there's going to be some unique opportunities. Today, we don't we're we're mostly in uh, multifamily, and uh, we focus currently we're focusing more on affordable housing because it's shorter term. Uh, they're shorter term developments, so we're a little more defensive in this environment, um, more in shorter term investments, that kind of thing. And there are various hedges in our business for when interest rates go up. Uh, one of them, for example, is mortgage servicing rights. Like we can invest in mortgage servicing rights and they go up in value when interest rates go up. So there's a lot of flexibility in our business um, when rates go up. Uh, one thing that's unique, uh, I guess about a year and a half ago, hard money loans, we would lose a point. So you know how we pay out investors a 10 or 12% return? Um, well, it's much better to lose a point than it is to pay out 10 or 12. 
right? Think about that. That's a lot of cash drag while we're waiting to make a purchase. Um, but today we're actually making money in hard money because the rates have gone up. So in an area where we used to lo lose a point or two, we actually make money now. We're actually making a point or two uh, because the rates have increased. So there's advantages and disadvantages when the markets change like this. Uh, but really, it's just uh, adjusting. You have to adjust your, uh, you have to pivot and you have to adjust your strategy and your tactics. Um, we're pretty experienced at that. I mean, we started 2007 in an up market. We went through the biggest real estate crash ever. Uh, we are heavily in residential, right? So we experienced a lot of that. Then we had COVID. Um, you know, we never missed a payment, never not paid upon maturity. We haven't really missed a beat the entire time. It doesn't mean we weren't impacted. Uh, COVID, for example, um, we had to start to work remote, for example, and we did that, uh, but the government really wasn't set up to work remote, right? The, a lot of the courthouses were closed and that impacted us uh, pretty dramatically during COVID. Now we, we weathered that pretty well, actually, uh, but it did impact us and we had to shift, our, shift some gears around and shift some revenue strategies. But the good news is we have those vehicles to do that. Um, so you are correct uh, in a higher interest rate environment, it does impact uh, the returns and some of the investments, that kind of thing. So we just have to adjust uh, based on what's going on in the marketplace at that time. And what might be the last question is, is this any different from traditional REITs? Yes. So a real estate investment trust is, well, they have a lot of rules around a REIT. For example, they have to distribute a lot of their income, whether they want to or not, for example. Right. And a lot of them are publicly traded. There are private REITs, though. Um, and a lot of times they have a lot more restrictions. We have looked at that structure before. We, you know, thought about, you know, should we become a REIT? You know, do we be, go public someday? You know, these are all great questions as you grow. Um, for us, with the amount of requirements and restrictions, it doesn't make sense for us. Um, and if you see a lot of real estate uh, REITs have been struggling lately, because if you think about a lot of the office space is, is REITs, right? Which was always traditionally one of the safest buckets ever. And you're seeing today that that's not the case, right? Because uh, we're not using as much office space. There's a, an abundance of office space right now. It's not easy to convert office space. So a lot of those REITs that are in retail or office space are struggling right now. I mean, malls are trading at 40 cents on the dollar, right? So it's going to be difficult to repurpose all of that. And it's not really easy to repurpose some of that space uh, into, say, multifamily. Like I was in construction for 22 years, right? It's not easy to take an office building and make it an apartment. That's, that's an expensive endeavor because there's just not the infrastructures there to do that easily. So you'd have to have some pretty interesting things going on to make that pencil out and work. Yeah. So you're going to see some, uh, some of the REITs are going to be struggling um, I know there's some in the Philadelphia area. One is my landlord that owns 200 and something office buildings, right? Um, and there's some vacant space in these buildings. Um, uh, so yeah, it is going to be an interesting time, but I think that's what creates opportunities for folks too. Uh, so I think we're going to see some shakedown, uh, some available opportunities, especially in multifamily where people have bridge financing that's resetting. So there's going to be a lot of opportunity for a uh, capital managed firm like PPR. So it's going to be interesting going forward, especially in the next six to 18 months. I think you're going to uh, see some really good opportunities for us. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, Dave, it seems that that has wrapped up the Q&A portion. Um, so I would just like to thank you on behalf of Camel Plan and on behalf of the listeners uh, for taking your time to talk through all of this with us. I know personally, I learned a lot. It sounds like the viewers, uh, we're very interested, had a lot of questions and probably learned a lot as well. So thank you so much. My pleasure, Michael. Have a great day. You do the same.